Charles. Does everybody know everybody? No. Some of you know each other. So there, there's something of a mix in our gathering today, my understanding is. Uh, part of the mix is some newer people practicing some form of meditation and following some spiritual teachings. And then there are some members of our devotee community. So I, the topic that I was requested to speak about is, as you see here, the art of mindfulness. And not exactly, but your processes of meditation that help one become more focused and more efficient and effective in day-to-day -day life and in the overall journey of life. Uh, I was asked to speak on this topic at uh, um, universities, one university in particular. The students requested this, so I started preparing. and. Um, I certainly had heard, like many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the term mindfulness. I didn't know how pervasive it was until I started inquiring about it. Uh, one family I was staying with for some time, when I was preparing this presentation, was a gentleman who worked in the corporate sector, an IT person. So I asked him, in, in the corporate world, is mindfulness a, a, a commonly used term? And his answer was really positive, it was, oh yes. Everybody in our corporation that has a management position must take a seminar on the mindful manager. I was surprised. And then I went to the university and the, um, the wife had just completed her studies in England, the UK, and master's degree in something. So I asked her, in, in, in the UK, is mindfulness a common term that's used by people in general? And the answer was, oh yes. So I said, could you give some examples? And she said, well here's one, mindful eating. And I asked, what, you know, what is it, how is it used? She said, well, it's two things. It's the food choices, be selective, not just be engaged in gluttony, this tastes good, so therefore I do it. But be mindful that something that's going to be healthy, nourishing, beneficial for your health. And the second is mindful about what the purpose of eating is purpose of eating, mindful people understand there's a mission of your life and you're helping to help, you're helping to prepare this body to fulfill the mission of life. But of course then you have to ask the question, what's my mission in life? If you're not mindful you won't ask that question, you'll just eat. So I said, that's interesting, you okay. Hmm. And what else? And she said right away, you know, mindful walking. And then other things that you do every day, common is this mindfulness term about what you do every day, rather than just do it mechanically, <coughs> you're, as you go from point A to point B, you're mindful of why you're going from point A to point B. So you're not absent, you're present in, in the moment, being mindful. Okay. I didn't ask, are there other ones? Say, so, yeah, I got the picture. Uh, obviously, the term mindfulness has to do with the mind, and the mind is um, like a computer, or computers are like the mind, actually. The computers are binary processors. I'm not a computer technology person, but this much I know. It's a binary processor. And um, 
So it involves the mind, but mindfulness is keeping the mind either on the one or the zero, whichever is you, you have capacity to direct the mind. So what directs the mind? Well, if you don't have intelligence, you won't find out, but if you have intelligence, that's what directs the mind. That's Bhagavad Gita. Intelligence, Indriyani Paranyahur, the, the senses are superior to dull matter. The mind is superior to the senses. The intelligence is superior to mind and above all is the soul. So real mindfulness is mindfulness of who we are. Mindful of the soul and the soul has a connection with, this, with the source of everything as does everything else that comes from the source of everything mindful of our source of everything and the connection to everything with the source of everything. That's when mindfulness becomes more complete. But the, the term, the modern, my understanding of, the modern use of the term comes from a Buddhist conception uh, that says over and over again, be mindful, or another phrase is be in the moment. Because according to Buddhism, um, what what exists? Well, the past doesn't exist because it's gone. The future doesn't exist because it happened hasn't happened yet. All there is is the moment. So be mindful of being in the moment. And then there's something else that happens after that. When you become mindful of being in the moment, you become really practiced at it and disciplined at it. The goal is to go beyond the moment. And what's beyond the moment? Nirvana. Mindfulness has a goal. Nirvana. And what does nirvana mean? It's a Sanskrit term that means cessation of material activity or cessation of material existence. Literally speaking, it means out of, out of the forest, near Vana, out of the forest of material existence. And when you're on the other side of the forest of material existence, what's there? If you're a Buddhist, it's nirvana. It's just, it's just negation, cessation of this. What's that? It's nothing. Cessation of this is nirvana. So it's a, it's a procedure to become free from suffering. Because Buddha's teaching is the root of all suffering is desire. And to become free from desire, become, excuse me, to become free from suffering, become free from desire. And how? Mindfulness. Live a life of goodness, nonviolence, etc., 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 compassion and charity and all good things. Live a life of goodness, and within the life of goodness, be mindful. So that you can achieve becoming free from desire, so you can enter into a state of nothingness. Lovely, huh? But that's the goal. No suffering. And <coughs> this life of goodness is a life of being in the moment. According to Bhagavad Gita, our mindfulness is influenced by the three modes of nature. This is a Bhagavad Gita lesson. Passion is planning the future. Ignorance is lamenting over the past. And goodness is being in the moment. So it's hard for people to be in the mode of goodness because of the strong influence of passion and ignorance. And therefore it's good to cultivate goodness if you want to be mindful. So your eating habits and so many other habits need to be in alignment with goodness. And for that matter, all the variegatedness of material existence, the species of life, and within a species, within a family, within a person, within different times of the day for the same person, modes of nature influence us. So to go beyond the modes of nature is a consequence of mindfulness done properly is to start with the mode of goodness and um, 
is a Picasso painting showing the mind. Because according to Bhagavad Gita, this is Picasso illustrating, he didn't know it, but he was illustrating, the mind can be the greatest friend or the worst enemy. It's the same mind. So happiness and distress, and to go beyond happiness and distress, going, go, going beyond duality. So this, this idea of meditation is to achieve this state of mindfulness has means different things to different people. Probably some of the persons in the room. My meditation means different things. So a common one is just some simple relaxation. Take a meditation break and go and be relaxed. Or for other people it's um, something that's a little more on the devotional side specifically. Uh, devotional exercise. You do something that leads to a calm state and you can be more contemplative or meditative and so one thing leads to the next thing and that's the meditation process for some people. Um, some it's some particular spiritual subject matter, some it's a particular object and that objects help you be in a meditative state. I'm going to give you an example as we go along. Um, you'll see. I'll make mention. So, different... I don't know if anybody here in the room has done this one, but I did it when I was in college and I learned about meditation. Candle meditation is a mechanical practice and one of the things that candle meditation does is um, when there's wind the candle moves and when there's no wind the candle is still and because the candle flame is luminous by bringing your visual attention to the candle flame um, you feel <coughs> some light within and some energy within is part of the process of candle meditation from my personal experience and it's taken different forms in you know modern ways and people do things different ways but it's not uncommon it's actually common uh, mandala meditation some of our younger people may not know what mandala is but there's one in the lower left it's a symmetrical geometric pattern and is common in Buddhism as you see up in the upper right that's some Buddhist monks in the lower right they're filling in the mandala and then on the upper right they're doing mandala meditation there's four monks in this particular case I've seen where there's like eight seated on these special seats as you see on the upper left and it takes practically a day to fill up the mandala, or a good part of the day, and then they lean over, like you're seeing from the overhead projection, and they have this um, instrument, looks like a chopstick, and it's brown generally in color and very thin, and they point to a particular part of the mandala, and they just meditate on that part of the mandala silently and then some signal, a gong, and they move to another part and by the end of the day they've meditated on the different parts of the mandala and then they sit back and meditate on the whole mandala. It's kind of like teamwork. Mm -hmm. Meditate on the parts and then the whole. And that's, you know, it takes a whole day. A whole day on mandala meditation. You do that daily it becomes, it does something to the synapses of the brain. You can really concentrate your mind on something and then see the part has its connection with the whole. And you're, there's a socialization process involved in you doing with other monks. Um, the University of Bridgeport, just on Friday, one of the students said, you know, I have a problem with meditation because I, you know, I start to feel lonely. So what about that? Because I, I don't want to feel lonely. 
So this is one way you don't feel lonely, do meditation. Or there's mantra meditation where you can chant together with other people that do mantra meditation. Chakra meditation is another common one. Not so common, but it was common when I was in college and kind of faded and now it's with yoga practice it's becoming a little more known. Energy centers in the spine and what what happens when you do is you concentrate on the, the base of the spine, just bring your mind there and you start to feel, if you do it properly, you'll feel some energy there, because there is, and by bringing the mind there, it becomes energized by the mind. And then some heat, some warmth. And then just stay there. It's not like you get a hot seat, but it's just you feel it. And then the next energy center or chakra, and then continue and continue up to the Brahmarandra. The yogis that are very expert at this, there's a, in a baby, mothers probably know this, there's a soft spot in the skull of the baby. That's the Brahmarandra. And after some time, it, it become, that's the same softness, but it's still a place at the, at the top of the skull. And yogis that know this chakra meditation, they can elevate consciousness, which means the soul, to then travel wherever they'd like. They're yogis that can travel within the universe, anywhere in the universe. Without a passport and a visa and a 747, they can just <laughs> go wherever they like. They, you know, Sometimes they bathe in the sacred river over here and pop up in the sacred river over there and they, they know how to move around because they have this skill. It's, it's a meditation shakti or siddhi. So another one is this on sacred syllables. This is a syllable om or the sound of om or both. That's a, another type of meditation that some people like etc. There's many modalities, but the, the, the essence is fixing the mind. And anybody that has practiced yoga and meditation knows that to do yoga effectively, you have to be have a strong mind. You can't do it effectively. This is a, a photo journal article that appeared a while ago in the New York Times. And the, the, photo, the, the photographer uh, selected, you know, interesting, 108 leading yoga practitioners who not just were good at yoga, but they saw it as part of a spiritual journey. He took photographs of them and uh, shows better in my screen than it does on that one, but my reason for picking this out of the so many photographs is um, I know I couldn't do that. <laughs> And it's not just like he's doing a handstand. He's holding it for some time. I mean, not just while the photographer, but he, you know, who's, who knows how long he can, like standing like a tree. Because his mind is very concentrated. In order to do this, not just you have a flexible body, you have to have very concentrated mind. And there's a, a particular point for showing this According to Srimad Bhagavatam, when in the absence of bhakti, what do you fix your mind upon? There's a nice text in Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, spoken by the Vishnu Dutas to the Yama Dutas. You know who they are? You know who the Yama Dutas are, the agents of Yamaraj. So there's this confrontation between the agents of Vishnu and the agents of Yamaraj over Ajamila, who at the time of death called the sun, to help him when he saw the Yamadutas, he was so scared, he called out his son's name as if his little son's going to help him. And he had named his son Narayana because when he was young, 
he had a life of devotion to Narayan, and he got a little deviated, more than a little deviated, he became a very fallen man. So, um, if we could move forward a little bit, that would make it easier for our host and hostess to accommodate everybody that's coming. Just a little shuffling, if that's okay. Thank you, thank you. So, this is um, the Vishnu Dutta's saying, actually, excuse me, it's Shukadeva Goswami speaking to Maharaj Prikshit. Shukadeva Goswami says, there are practices such as meditation, sacrifice, tapasya, elevating activities that can take one to this, he doesn't use this language, but a place of higher consciousness. But, anyone that's done meditation knows, the modes of nature pull one back down again. So one cannot remain unless there's a place of shelter. So the image, what's, you know, what is this yogi meditating upon? I don't know. I don't know if that's in the interview, but it, it, there has to be some strong power of concentration. But to do anything, you know, those of you that are have a career, or those of you that are taking exams in school, you have to have some concentration. And to be an athlete or to be a to be anything, controlling the mind and senses is essential. But towards what end? And if it's the object that's the end, is something that's temporary, it's not permanent because it's temporary. Hmm. So the yoga process that's recommend, recommended is described in Bhagavad Gita. This is a nice image right from the internet. There's a, a pond and there's storm. And when the rain is falling down on the pond, it's making ripples and becoming disturbed. But a yogi knows the art of not being disturbed. That kind of meditation. The Sanskrit word is dhira, D-H-I-R-A. Even when there's cause of disturbance, when the mind remains undisturbed, that's what the dhira state is. Dhira. Just like this little girl, she's always undisturbed. <laughs> Dira. Oh, Dira. <laughs> so, that's mindfulness. Even there's, you know, like when rivers pour into the sea, the sea doesn't become disturbed by the rivers pouring into the sea. When desires, or let's say emotion, negative emotion or positive emotion, it's part of the world in which we live. It's a place of duality and something comes, sometimes and sometimes. And when there's mindfulness that's taken shelter of something that's not temporary but is permanent, then that's yoga, that's meditation, that's this mindfulness. So Buddhists have their picture of what mindfulness is, the Vedas have their picture of what mindfulness is, and according to the Bhagavad Gita message, it's, we use this term divine mindfulness, or mindfulness where your, your mind becomes connected to that which is the source of everything. The absolute truth, according to the Vedas, by definition, it's a nice, very simple definition, the absolute truth is that from which everything comes. Whatever that is, when you become mindful of that, that's divine mindfulness, because it's the source of everything. And then you can, be, you can remain fixed where 
negative and positive come, happiness and distress come, winter and summer season come and go. It's starting to get a little cooler here in Boston. It's not uncomfortable yet, but it's, we know what it means. Winters in Boston get pretty cold. But it says, so, but what are you going to do? If you're, a, if you study Bhagavad Gita, you tolerate. Matras parshas to kanteya sitoshna sukha dukha da agama payo nityas Tangs tatiksha. Tatiksha means tolerate. Tangs tatiksha svabharata. That's just the beginning. Tolerate, and then there's, you go beyond tolerating. You just become fixed in the source of everything through mindfulness, and you're never disturbed. Another verse in the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita is even in the greatest calamity. Calamity. You rem you remain undisturbed. You remain happy, even in the midst of calamity. That's kind of like a contradiction. But when that divine mindfulness is reached, that's what happens. Because the happiness, real happiness, is something inside. It's not what's the weather today. What's the configuration of duality today? Oh, I like it. Oh, I don't like it. Oh, he said something mean. Oh, they said something nice. Etc. And my, my mother-in-law is griping at me again. <laughs> <laughs> or something. So the, the, the means of getting there, mindfulness, is this recommended in the, the whole of the Vedas is resting on sound. So sound meditation, mantra meditation, meditation on sacred sounds. So just spend a little bit of time on sound meditation. I'm going to end. Um, sound is very powerful. High frequency sound, for example, remotely can shatter glass. Or sound can be used to kill people or paralyze people or use, you know, your tax dollars are helping government develop weapons that can immobilize people through sound. And then who knows what's going to happen when that gets out into the marketplace, becomes commercialized, just like drones or cell phones. It was, it's a war technology. Anyway, without going into it, let's see what happens with sound weaponry. Uh, music therapy, there's lots of modern examples of this. Not like in place of healing methodologies of allopathy or Ayurveda, but in addition to, it's very helpful. It's been demonstrated all over the place with lots of medical research by different Harvard Medical School and this and that. Um, I came across an article by a, uh, this Dr. James Hartzell. Uh, he's from Spain. And he, he's, he's a neurologist. And so his, that's his profession. And then his avocation or his hobby was Sanskrit. He learned Sanskrit. He got a degree in Sanskrit. He translated things in Sanskrit. He really liked Sanskrit. So when he retired, he went to India and took his skill as a neurologist with MRIs and this and that and studied Brahmins that chant Sanskrit for some number of hours a day and saw what's their neurological makeup, how does it compare to those that don't. And he found the cerebral cortex, the memory <coughs> part of the brain was like so much more developed and uh, the memory was three or four times better. So those of you that are young and you want to do well in school, Chant Sanskrit. 
you'll do better in school. It's a fact. It's a, and so he, in, in journals he published he, what he called the Sanskrit effect. There's many such things. I'm just going to mention one more. Uh, this is from the mid 60s, 70s, a, a Swiss engineer and medical doctor invented a machine. He called it a tonoscope. And rather than reading all the text there, it's, it's a machine that has three parts. It generates a sound. Second part is a channel or a tube that the sound is directed through so it's very focused. And then the third part is a surface membrane or crystals or this or that upon which some powder or some other material is placed to see what happens with the, how does sound effect matter? That was his curiosity. He and uh, someone that earlier than him, 30 years worth of study, plus his 20 years worth of study, with very, very detailed notes, showed what you see over here. Over on the left is from, directly from the, the Vedic texts, it's called Sri Yantra. It's not just like Sri Vaishnavism, it's Sri Yantra means it's a two-dimensional depiction of the spiritual world, the Vaikuntha. If you wanted to depict in two dimensions, what's Vaikuntha? That's what it would look like, according to the Vedas. Now that, how old are the Vedas? Pretty old. So this is in the 1900s, and this, these two medical practitioners, using a tonoscope, found that when you direct the sound ohm through the tonoscope, it makes the Sri Mandala, the Sri Yantra. And then they take away that sound or some other sound, it goes back to chaos. Here comes the Om again, and it starts, it takes a little while, it configures like this. Here's another depiction of a Sri Yantra, very clear and detailed. Here's a photograph of what was on the surface of the tonoscope material. It just it left space, according to these lines, go back and forth a couple times. Which means, what? Om, the sacred syllable Om, has form. And that form impacts the configuration of matter. Our bodies are made of matter. And it's really important what sounds you hear. Just like music mode of goodness, mode of passion, mode of ignorance, without detailing it. There's another research that was done somewhere in North Dakota. A lady who, whose profession it was, what do you call it when you grow plants? Horticulture? Yeah, horticulture, horticulturalist. She had greenhouses. So she got a grant and so, so what she did was, in some of those greenhouses, she played classical music and some of the other greenhouses she played rock music <laughs> and some of the other ones it was heavy metal and rap music which is really isn't music it's just music. <laughs> <laughs> and the growth of the plants corresponded and then the next season she just you know same plant she just changed the music and they responded to the music the healthiest ones were the mode of goodness sound vibration and she did it for a few years and got the same result sound affects consciousness even in plants what to speak of more evolved consciousness of human beings the Vedic picture of sound is it takes one to the language that I use in China is the place of higher consciousness or for this audience it takes you to Vaikuntha just through sound. Your consciousness gets connected to Vaikuntha consciousness or divine consciousness or divine mindfulness just through sound. 
So there's different types of meditation, but most effective scientific research, there's a, I have a whole pile of it, and it's, you know, different, different, different people in the world have studied. Specifically, mantra meditation is very effective. There's a problem when you're doing any meditation, including mantra meditation, that's chanchila himana krishna, bhagavat, very strong and turbulent. It's hard to control the mind. Therefore, there has to be an object that you connect with to curb the restless mind. And it's possible. It's not like snap your fingers and, okay, what's next? But it's possible. Um, something that I want to share, because it connected to this topic. Uh, several times, this is a, an image of a lamp. So, several times I heard my spiritual master say, the living entity is both conscious and consciousness. And I thought, that sounds cool. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> and what's the intention of my spiritual master saying it from time to time? It wasn't like many, many times that I was puzzled. I knew that I didn't know and I wanted to know. That's a nice place to be. When you know that you don't know, but you still want to know, that's a good place to be. So it, it, it took many years and finally I came across an explanation by one of our acharyas, Jiva Goswami, who quotes a verse from the Upanishads, which says, just like a lamp is both luminous and it lights up objects in the room like pots and plates, so similarly the living entity is both conscious and consciousness. So we're conscious, and that consciousness not only spreads through the body, but through the senses it spreads out extending from the body into the world around us. And when that conscious entity leaves, consciousness leaves. So meditation means to connect your consciousness ultimately, the topmost form of meditation. You can read it in chapter six, Bhagavad Gita, Samadhi is like Michelangelo's painting. This is, um, laser pointers don't work with screens like this. On the left, that's Adam. On the right, that's God. And he says, by the touch of God, life comes into the body of Adam. That's like, you know, the Michelangelo's depiction, at least. And meditation is like that, reaching your consciousness towards the source of everything. That's mindfulness, divine mindfulness. And most effective, according to the Vedic teaching of all the systems of mindfulness or meditation, is mantra meditation. And it's a, it's a path, mantra meditation is part of the path of yoga that brings purity to the body, to the mind, to the heart, and connecting the heart and the body and the mind, connecting our faculties to the soul. Um, through sound vibration, then you can realize who you really are. I'm pausing, to, to, I'm thinking to, to share something with you. Once upon a time I was a small boy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I grew up near a lake and those of you in Boston, you may know a little bit about, at least the kids may know, the geography of New York State. Right in the middle of New York State, there's the Finger Lakes. Five, the long lakes. So I lived along one of them. And I spent a lot, I spent as much time in the water as I did on the land. It was like really nice recreation for kids. So I have a lot of visual experience with what it's like when there's a storm and what it's like when there's no storm. And when there's no storm, you can see down in the bottom of the lake 
I remember this specifically as I'm speaking it, a golf ball that's like 30, 35, 40 feet deep in the lake and you can see it. But when it's turbulent, you can't see anything. So similarly, when the mind becomes miraculously peaceful, then you can see who you really are. You can see pratyaksha avagamam dharmyam susukam kartam avdhyayam from Bhagavad Gita. Pratyaksha, this knowledge, chapter 9 Bhagavad Gita is meant for direct pratyaksha, aksha's eyes, pratyaksha, direct perception of the self by realization. Bhagavad Gita's teaching is to give us direct realization of who we really are. I mean, there's the knowledge of who we really are. That's really easy. We'll all raise our hands saying, are you spirit soul or are you this body? We're spirit soul. Now, do we live our life that way? Hmm. Hmm. So, direct realization, like, you know, perceiving the golf ball, 35. So you have to have a lake that's calm. You have to have a mind that's calm, and and not just for a while, but you like steady calm. This dira stage. So uh, it it takes some effort. It's not just you know that's a nice notion. I like that one. And then you do you live differently, but this is a, a, a consciousness, a consciousness of who you really are and being connected with the source of everything. So that's mantra meditation. We were doing uh, at the beginning through musical mantra meditation. That was my response to the student at the University of Bridgeport. You know, there's silent meditation that you're, you may feel lonely and come and join us for the musical meditation and it's, it's you'll want to dance. Uh, but there's also this meditation using meditation bees which you can do in your home and uh, even a child can do so how frequently it's advisable this is um, from Patanjali some of you are nodding. Patanjali Yoga Sutras. He's like the authority on yoga. So he gives this really simple definition of abhyasa or practice. Abhyasa has three parts. Every day. Another. For a, pro for a prolonged period of time. That practice. And then the third is where there's some faith or confidence or trust going to take you to a good place because any one of those three that's missing and it's not abhyasa according to Patanjali so something every day and for the recommend duration you know start with 10 minutes and that's what I did and 10 minutes became 20 minutes became a half an hour became you know so I would say, I, I regularly say this, for the past 49 years, I've been engaged in mantra meditation for three hours every day. And that has an effect. I wouldn't keep doing it for three hours every day for 49 years if it didn't have an effect. <laughs> and, you know, neurologically, according to neurologists, it does something to the synapses it does something more than, you know, the, your, your hardware changes or even your software changes, your heart changes. But all three change. Your emotional experience of the world around you. The world around you may not change, but the way that you experience the world around you changes to a place of balance or ballast or a, a core spiritual strength that carries you through the, the dualities of this world. And a, a, a joy. That's something that's inside. That's something that's out there. Happiness and distress is out there. 
Sukha and Dukkha. That's what's out there. And then there's something else that's inside, Ananda. The living entity, according to Vedic teaching, is Sat, eternal. Chit, like this lamp, is conscious. And Ananda, it's joyful. You can realize who you really are. You're, you can realize your nature, and just like seeing that golf ball in the, in the bottom of the lake, that's, that's calm. You can see who you really are. You can be who you really are. You can be with others knowing who they are, even if they don't know who they are. You can have genuine relationships on a spiritual platform. Recognizing differences, that's just fine because there's plenty of differences. And have a, a wholesome, meaningful, functioning relationship on a spiritual platform. And this mantra meditation has that effect. It's not, again, not a snap of fingers and okay, what's next? <laughs> because we're used to that, you know, take a tablet and your health is good now. But so it, it's, it's like anything that's wholesome, it takes some time. But the principle uh, is, is a Vedic principle. It's truth. You connect with truth and you realize, wow, it's true. So that's my little talk on, or sharing, on the uh, art of mindfulness leading to mantra meditation. So let's see if there's some... There we go. Those images at the, at the beginning, that was for children. <laughs> Just to take them through a little exercise, so like it's a, an icebreaker. Any discussion, comments or questions? Yes. Uh, we have the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Yeah. And there are also other, uh, we've got... Uh, so many mantras. Yeah, with Om and Vishnu's mantras and everything. So Fine. why this particular mantra and it doesn't have Om in it? Okay. Fantastic question. <clears throat> and there's, there's a few answers. Um, those mantras that have Om in it, and usually there's Namaha in it, and usually there's a name, Narma in Sanskrit, means it's a Vedic mantra, and it's Vedic mantras are to be received by mantra diksha. And without mantra diksha, they don't have the same effectiveness. One can chant them, but without receiving them through mantra diksha, specifically even in disciplic succession, they don't have the same effectiveness. I'll explain that, come back to that. But this Hare Krishna mantra, anyone can chant because it doesn't have those same Vedic three elements. The um, Bija mantra, the Om, the Namaha, the offering of obeisances, and then that person to whom you're propitiating, a Vishnu name. It's to be received, not just read in a book or hear it in a group and sing it, say it, or whatever. The effectiveness is receiving. So, Hare Krishna mantra is for anybody, everybody. And it's, it's important, the anybody, everybody mantra, because in this age of Kali, who, who has the qualification to give and to receive? Because before receiving a Vedic mantra, there's all kinds of training. Not just like, you know, pay some money or go somewhere and get a mantra and then like, okay, I can... You get the idea. There has to be some qualification. Before the young boy receives his 
Gayatri Mantra, the standard is he receives all kinds of training before that. Because it's through a Gayatri Mantra he can then enter into the study of the Vedas, but he has to have qualification to study the Vedas before receiving the Mantra, before studying the Vedas. And without that qualification, it doesn't have the same e efficacy. But So, within the Vedas, there's the Vaidika system and there's the Pancharatrika system. And the Pancharatrika system is one in which this, without Om, without the three parts, when anyone can chant to become purified. There's a mantra within that section that says, Om Apavitra Pavitro Va. Purified or unpurified. Sarvasam Gatopiva, having passed through A to Z, all circumstances of life. Ya, such a person, smaret, remembers Pundarikaksham. He crosses over fearfulness and becomes suchi. So that that access to that mindfulness is through this Hare Krishna mantra. There are other mantras that don't have Om in it, but this, so now specifically, this Hare Krishna mantra is mentioned in the Upanishads. Of all mantras, for this age of Kali, one is outstanding as the Maha mantra, the most effective for this age, and it gives the same mantra exactly as we say it. So, we, you know, we need to follow the Vedas, we need all the help we can get. <laughs> so, if it's special for this age, just like, this is a simple example, but supposing you go to a pharmacy, you know, Western pharmacy or an Ayurvedic pharmacy, you say, I'd like some medicine. There's all kinds of medicine back there in the pharmacy shop. Well, what, what, what's your disease? So it's specific for the disease. Oh, okay, that medicine. This is specific for the age of Kali. It's recommended by the mantra experts, the Upanishads. So, therefore, this one. Now, does it mean that you, there's no benefit from the others? There's benefit from the others. But the full benefit isn't going to be achieved. And the, 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 the full benefit of the Hare Krishna mantra is to help qualify one to receive those other mantras. Because in this age of Kali, Kalao Shudra Sambhavan, people are born not so qualified. And there's reasons why they're not so qualified. We could identify that a little bit. Can you sit down? So we can see. Thank you. Uh, receiving mantra through disciplic succession. There's a statement within the Vedas that says, I'm just quoting, the Vedas say, if you have a mantra that has not been received through disciplic succession, nishpala, it doesn't bear fruit. And therefore, such a person who has mantra that has not been received through disciplic succession must receive mantra through disciplic succession so they can receive the fruit. But then, disciplic succession is one, being sufficiently qualified to receive the mantra is another. And so the Hare Krishna mantra has that effect. Cheto darpana marjanam Cheta means consciousness or mind. One becomes darpana, marginal, cleansed. The heart and the mind become cleansed. And it is the first experience, first effect. Because like, it's not so clean compared to Vedic standards of what clean is. So for those reasons and more, uh, the recommendation is following what the Vedas recommend for us take this mantra along with whatever else you like and find beneficial for you you do that too but this is has special effect 
And when you experience that special effect, you know, you feel good about the special effect and the thing that's helping you get that special effect. It's not to say, so saying this doesn't mean there's not other processes that amount to zero. It's not judgmental. It's just a very effective method that is for everybody. All over the world, qualified, unqualified, regardless of birth and upbringing and socioeconomic, color, race, gender. Pavitra, apavitra. Anything. Yes. Is there any study uh, done for donor scope to be subjected to Hare Krishna Mahamatra? Or anybody looking into that? I don't know. Maybe it's worthwhile to... Yeah, you, you, you can take it. <laughs> <laughs> Guruji, on that note, can I say something? Sure! So, Mind Math Institute is one of the organizations doing enormous research in this area. Mind Mapping? Mind Math Institute. Mind Math? Yes. M-A-T-H? Yes. Does studies so, in what? Mantras? No. The thing is, uh, they are measuring, scientifically measuring, the impact of the waves when people gather and uh, meditate in ah. whatever the manner. Some people may be focusing on an object, like their sure. okay. favorite object. Yeah. Some people may be... A sound or a gong or something. Yeah. So they take uh, hundreds of monks from all around the world. Yes, yes, yes. They take them to the place where uh, there are conflicts in the world and uh, they scientifically measure when they are meditating how it brings the harmony in that particular area. Okay. That's one. And, uh, and this is connected with math? <laughs> <laughs> the name of the company is Mind Math. Mind math. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, okay. It has nothing to do with math. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, well, they're they're measuring. That's what they're doing. That's right. what, That's the math part. Yes. Yeah. So just to prove scientifically. Because science, you got to measure stuff. Otherwise, it, you know, you can't even talk about it. Right. Because <laughs> that that convinces the people who are not uh, who get turned off by when you talk about Vedas, religions, and all. Yeah. Yeah. So a similar study done recently. Sure, everyone has faith in science, so if science says it's got to be okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> there's th that, like that one slide, there's so many studies. Right. And the uh, Alter Trades is the another study. 13 universities in the U.S. and uh, Wisconsin, okay. uh, they measured scientifically. They bought hundreds of monks. They staged the monks in uh, each university for a couple of days and they made them meditate and they scientifically recorded the impacts of the harmony in the area. So, so those are the how do they measure the harmony in the area? Do you know how they did that? Uh, measuring the waves, like alpha, beta, theta. Okay, uh, so waves. the brain waves of the people right. where the monks were doing their meditation yeah, I mean, before no. and after. Right. And their brain so, waves became more calm. Right. Okay. So when there is a high conflict area, yeah. they take them there. Yeah. It has and studies show that's the silent meditation but when you add sound there's a big spike in the effectiveness okay sound goes up in the you know the, the brain waves scale yes yeah. yeah. they didn't separate which meditation yeah. was best yeah. but whatever they choose to meditate well yeah. you know herbert benson at harvard medical school did a few decades worth of study on that they are part of this study. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, it's sound meditation is more effective than without sound. For as far as the, the subjective report, as far as medical wellness is concerned, healing of some illness with the same medical treatments, 
and so forth. There's lots of so many studies, so many studies. Yeah, right up. Um, how does yoga help in the art of mindfulness? How does it help? Yeah. Well, depends on what type of yoga one does. <laughs> but supposing it's the yoga that people do at yoga schools, that kind, hatha yoga or asanas. You know what asanas are, right? So, people that do asanas at a yoga studio. It just helps to make the body, energy within the body, more balanced instead of imbalanced. And then that helps, the, the body being balanced helps the mind become more balanced or peaceful. And then commonly in yoga studios, they also teach pranayama, that's breath control. And that specifically is intended to help bring the mind to a restful position, not a sleep position kind of rest, but a calm, balanced kind of position and then uh, so it hel that helps with concentration mindfulness requires some concentration so those two things help in bringing concentration mindfulness and also like the handstand also like all of those tricky stuff that guy the handstand guy? <laughs> 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 all those tricky How does that help? Yeah. It's just, you know, I don't know because I don't do it, but <laughs> my understanding is it's, it's a, to do that requires more mindfulness than just doing asanas, the usual kind. So it, it's like you know, more of a challenge to your mindfulness and of course more of a challenge to the flexibility of your body, but that they, they both go together, the flexibility and the mindfulness. It's just a step up in the mindfulness. And flexibility. They go together. But the, so the purpose of that mindfulness isn't complete just by being able to hold that yoga position. That, that was part of the message. That's that's a step in the direction, and then keep going. What does the keep going look like? That's what I wanted to share and show. Yeah. That's my question. Um, may not be related. Not related. May, may, may not be, but, but related to the Hare Krishna mantra. Um, I mean, my mind is constantly thinking like a. Hi, when, when we say that Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, I, I, I like the pastimes or I look up to the Lord Ram's uh, pastimes uh, more for my day-to-day -day activities. Okay. But uh, Krishna, they say three utterances of Lord Ram, his name is equal to one uh, name one name of Krishna. I didn't and say it, the Vedas said <laughs> it. <laughs> And you want me to unpack that one? I can't do that. Yeah. So my question is related to that, like, and Krishna is the source of all incarnation. Why did the mantra is just a limit to Krishna? It's not Hare Krishna. It's, wait, come on, it's, it, you've only got half the mantra. <laughs> What's the other half of the mantra? Hare ah. <laughs> Krishna is the source of all incarnation. Yeah. So, what's your problem? <laughs> I'm just, just like, I mean, these thoughts coming into my mind when chanting. So, I mean, I, I should accept the mantra yeah. as, as for a fair form of faith, but. Uh, well, you can be inquisitive. Then you know this. I want to know, and I know that I don't know. That's good. It's a good space to be in. But you know. I don't know exactly what your question is. Your mind is disturbed that, you know, three names of Ram it takes to make one name of Krishna. Why is, that, why is it like that? I can't answer that. Be, you know, but Krishna is the source of all incarnations and Ram is one of them. Yeah. So, and of all the incarnations, why Lord Ram added, added to that mantra? Well, why not? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
いじられた<笑>サリーマン。Me too. <笑> But he, he, there's this nice explanation in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Some people say, and they're both right. Ram refers to Ramachandra. Some people say Ram refers to Balaram. Which is it? And the two camps fight. But you know they're both right because they're the one entity. So, if Krishna is the source of everything, why not? And if you know why Ram instead of some other entity, you know why not? I, uh, I like Ramayana, and not but, and I especially like Shrimad Bhagavatam for a variety of reasons. But I like Shrimad Bhagavatam. So, for me, when I chant, for me, when I chant Hari Rama, it's the source of all strength. Rama, referring to Balarama, is the source of all strength, and one requires strength to do anything, and one requires spiritual strength to progress spiritually. So, when I call Hari Rama, it's Balarama. But I'm not like discriminating against Ramachandra. It's just that's my shelter and devotion. By the way, I'm in this month and the next two months. I'm absorbed in Aranya Kanda and Kishkinda Kanda because <laughs> we're going to those places. Oh, Ramachandra is nice too. <laughs> place of shelter, yeah. and just chant the mantra and be happy. Sure. <laughs> yes. Hi, Krishna. Guru. Hi, Krishna. Um, I have a question about whether or not any sound can be made to be sacred, and I'm thinking about the Krishna Core devotees in the mid '80s in New York City who. Um, used, you know, heavy metal and the punk rock scene to start, um, you know, devotionally um, started um, chanting the Hare Krishna mantra with that different sort of sound and instrumentation and also um, looking at, you know, we have devotees in our community today who are rapping devotionally. Um, they're rapping various yeah. mantras. So I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not it's really the substance of the sound that that matters the most. Well, the answer is yes, the substance of the sound matters the most. And uh, those that are doing the rap music today, it, 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 this is my guess, it's a combination of a strategy and their own nature. And put the two together. The strategy of reaching people that like rap music. Give them a chance to listen to classical music, forget it. But listen to rap music, they'll listen. <laughs> Not only they'll listen, but they know the, the lyrics like, you know, <laughs> kid knows the alphabet. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, I guess it's sort of youth of I mean, it's Everything they know the lyrics like <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm surprised so it's not just entertainment it's part of their culture so it's a strategy by people who have some kind of nature like that and so the essence is the essence or the same with the you know the straight edge scene and what they did, but those same people that did that for you know to reach the audience, they're not still doing it today. That was a strategy, mm -hmm. and now they're doing something very sattvic that was actually brought them to the sattvic position mm -hmm. by doing that. So the sound vibration was the essence. But that essence sound vibration carried them beyond those modes of nature that inspired them to be on stage in a smoke-filled place with lots of noise and become deaf hearing that loud volume. 
think. It changed their modes of nature. Mm-hmm. But the essence was the sound vibration. And same, you know, the people that hear it wouldn't hear the mantra, wouldn't hear Krishna's name if it was more sattvic. But they're getting purified. So the essence is the essence, and but the essence also helps elevate the modes of nature towards goodness and to transcendence. I don't think I could do it even as a strategy, but <laughs> <laughs> I'd have to find another group of people besides those, those groups. But you know. That's me. As a senior citizen, I don't know. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, oh. So, uh, uh, you have mentioned, like, you have titled your uh, presentation as The Art of Mindfulness. Yeah. But you have mentioned most, mostly scientific facts, like research topics. So, like, my question is, like, is mindfulness an art or science? Why does it have to be one or the other? There's a science to mindfulness, there's an art of mindfulness. Because as soon as when we say like, like the science of mindfulness, like we expect reasoning to everything. Of course, there's a reason for everything. <laughs> but like, is it available to us? Yes, why not? Knowledge comes from a perfect person, that's the source of everything, Krishna, and it comes through disciplic succession, so it's accessible to us through disciplic succession. Although it's beyond our senses, adhoksaja means what is beyond the senses, and yet we can receive through our senses. because the source is beyond the senses, so that sound connects us to that which is beyond our senses. That's what transcendental means. Beyond time, beyond guna and karma, beyond the temporary, beyond the mind and the senses, through sound. That's where the sound is coming from, and hearing that sound, using the senses, connects us to that place, that source, immediately. I mean, faster than a cell phone. You can speak to somebody on the other side of the world, like really fast. And there goes the sound <coughs> bouncing off a satellite. Come, yeah, how are you going? How's it going? What's the weather like over there? So we can. That there's there is some time involved in projecting sound through technology, but spiritual sound. There's no time delay, and you're immediately connected. Immediately connected to that which is beyond the temporary, through sound. Sound is spiritual or not temporary. Suppose like if the reasoning is beyond the sense, like is not understandable by our... Like, our well, what, what, what do you mean it's not understandable by? If, if your binary processor tells you, this is something that's beyond my binary processor, that's intelligence. And with intelligence, you can accept it's beyond my binary processor. But hey, here, here's an example. Let me give an example. Um, the example of Well, take the example of the tonoscope. Maybe there's another. Maybe there's another explanation. Or, you know, it's a possibility. It's not proof. It's evidence. Hmm. So, okay. It, but it, you know, science. The, the language of science today is something. I forget the, the exact language, but the most <coughs> plausible explanation. It's, n- it's never a proof. Through your senses you can never prove something 
absolutely most plausible explanation. So here's, you know, the work of Ian Stevenson is an example. Ian Stevenson is now deceased, but for some 40-something years at the University of Virginia, he had his own department of studying people that remembered their previous lives. And from all over the world, not just certain parts of the world. And there's YouTube things about this with families, Christian families that like forget reincarnation. But so people, that, their children remember their previous lives in detail. And again and again. So out of all of those thousands, tens of thousands of past life remembrances, He wants to play with your little puppy dog. <laughs> okay. There's one slice of the pie where there's some biological, he called, his last book was where biology and reincarnation intersect. So out of all the people that remembered their past lives, some have some bodily deformity or some mark or something, like a half a leg, or something or something, a scar from when they were born. And then people tell him about their previous life and he goes back to the birth record and that Mark was there from when they were born. It's not happened during their lifetime, it's from their previous life and it's connected to their previous life remembrance. So he goes back to the place where they say they were born and where they lived and someone, anyway, there's all kinds of things. Someone born with half a leg, born with half a leg. And in their past life, they were run over by a train. And they died mangled by a train, but it went, what, half of their leg was broken off by the train running over their, their body. And they remembered it. And they were born with half a leg. So, you know, the details of what their name was and when it happened and their family and this and that, and it matches. And like the whole book's full of people like that. It's not a proof. Maybe there's some other explanation. Likely. Again and again and again. So there's compelling evidence that says the soul that was in that previous body is now in this body and there's something from the previous body that marks physically the present body. And some of them are really embarrassing, like murder. Here's one. A girl was born with marks around her leg. You see the picture in his book of the girl with the marks around her leg. And she tells the story of her past life. First of all, you know, the birth records show those marks were there from, from the time she was born. In her past life, she was a man. And as a man, he was having an affair with another man's wife. The husband found out. The husband captured the man that was having the affair with his wife tied him up with ropes around his leg and threw him the bottom of a well and he died. So Ian Stevenson went back and interviewed the people. Yes, there was this man that died and he even interviewed the man that killed him and said, I killed him. He was having an affair with my wife. And his next life, he became a she. <laughs> with marks around their leg. Maybe there's some other explanation. But case after case, where the, there's a science to it. Now there's some notion to it. You have to interpret the evidence according to your, your picture of life. But there's so many evidences. There, you know, though, medical doctors that have out-of-body experiences reported to them by their patients during open-heart surgery when there's cardiac arrest. Now medically, I'm not a medical practitioner, but this much I know, when there's cardiac arrest, the blood stops moving. And when the blood goes to the brain, the brain's dead. So during cardiac arrest, Patients tell what happened during the cardiac arrest. And they were up floating up above the operation table. 
and they were looking down at the table and the doctor said this and the nurse did that and that did that but then he remembers the details of the conversation and then reports it back to the doctor after you know they survived the cardiac arrest so in disbelief because doctor so and so you know this is rubbish there's got to be some other explanation so after you know some number of years of study of other doctors that reported the same thing wrote a book you know much to my chagrin i have to say that there's the it appears it's not proof maybe some other explanation but the conscious self is not you know a chemical event a neurobiological event that's not what consciousness is because consciousness is stopped during cardiac arrest but now there's report of consciousness of the event that's going on down here on the operating table maybe there's some other explanation but you know reluctantly he had to acknowledge then there's like 10 of such books one of them i read I didn't read the whole thing but the lady she's from the university of washington medical school reported had a patient in cardiac arrest report that he not only went up up in the air above the operating table but across the ceiling out a window up two floors of 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 the of the hospital and was looking inside the janitor's closet <laughs> and on the ledge outside the janitor's closet was a pair of sneakers with different colored shoelaces and a little rip in the right shoe she's like what <laughs> and you can't see it from the inside you can only see it from the outside and the janitor had just changed the lock to the janitor's room. She, the person described what was in the janitor's room. And the, so sure enough, the shoes, the sneakers, with two different color shoelaces with the rip in the right shoe was there. Hmm, maybe there's some other explanation. <laughs> and then, you know, studies and studies and wrote a book. So the conscious self is not the body. Now is that science or is that something else? Just like a belief. Well, it's not a proof. You can't prove that which is beyond the senses. You have to use the senses to prove that which is within the senses. But it's not proof. There could be some other explanation we don't haven't come up with yet. And many, 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 many such s- studies of such events. So, how are we, are we living our lives according to the understanding that we're spirit soul? That's the real question. And is that an art or is it a science? (laughs) Well, it's both. There's a science and there's an art to applying the science. called mindfulness <laughs> by some people anyway bhakti by other people okay I think we're, we're ready to wind up are we ready for some what? Uh, we'll have a harti and then prasadam harti, yes. okay thank you very much you patient audience Pardon? Um, should I bring the cookies now?